as always, thank you, Tanya. Uh, yeah, so my name is Colin Chan. Like Tanya said, uh, I'm also a Wacom influencer. So what you guys are seeing here, I'm gonna shut this off. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about Wacom, what you see very, very, so what you see here is the uh, Wacom Pro Cintiq 32. It's the biggest and the baddest. And uh, I'm deciding to use this because it works so well with Corel Painter. And the lovely people from Wacom Canada, so any Canadians in here, they actually did a code for today until Sunday. So you get $30 off of Wacom One. Uh, just use the code Chan, C-H-A-N. And yeah, that's the basic idea. So without further ado, I'm gonna shut off my, <clears throat> my camera here and I'm gonna start uh, talking about choosing the right reference image, right? And like Tanya was saying, I'm going before you even start sketching, before you start drawing, painting, any of that, you wanna know how to pick the right reference. And a lot of this information is for beginners. So if you're a beginner, this is perfect for you. Um, if you're an intermediate or advanced artist, you probably all know this information. So what I'm going to do is first things first, as you can see here, this is the first painting that I did on the new 2022. Um, and below it is actually a reference. So I actually took this reference photo of my nephew. And uh, as you can see down here is completely different from what you see on top. All right. So I'm gonna be talking about how composition, how to choose it, all these lovely things. But the first thing we gotta start at is how are we choosing the right reference? So over here where you see a skull, um, I took this again with my smartphone and I usually have a checklist when I either take a picture or when I'm choosing a reference photo online, X, Y, Z, but the best reference photos for you to take is what I was always tell you. You have a really good camera on your phone, definitely use it. So the four categories that I broke it down to is one, subject matter, which you can see is the skull. Uh, two is perspective. So what I mean by perspective, I'm gonna be drawing these perspective lines here to kind of give you an idea of what I mean by perspective. All right, and you can see that I am kind of going sort of with and against the, the wood grains here. And when you're drawing, you have to draw what you know and not always what you see. So as you can see, this kind of helps you have information when you're about to do your thumbnail. Um, if I'm doing a thumbnail, I'm gonna be you know, looking at these grids and again, always, always, always putting as much information down when you're gesturing. Another thing I do wanna talk about, which is also in the category is perspective, which I already did, sorry, lighting. And with lighting, as you can see here, the, the more shapes, what I will say is the more shapes you see, the better reference photo you have, okay? So you can see the hard shapes, but one thing I can say is you should also look at the negative space that it creates. So instead of just looking at this black here, I would definitely be looking at this right here, these little lights coming through. And when I'm doing <clears throat> a gesture, sometimes you'll add those in as well to kind of give you that perspective and also information about the lighting because you now know this whole section here is all going to be dark. Um, and then the last but not least is the clarity of the image. And usually the clarity of the image uh, is tested by if you can zoom in and you can see here, again, shot this on an iPhone. And when you zoom in, there's a lot of really cool information such as reflective light. So you kind of see like a burnt sienna here and that's reflected from the sunlight hitting the floor and hitting the, the skull. And as you can see, again, more shapes, the better. So I'm kind of drawing out the shape that's there and you would kind of add these shapes to your gesture for your thumbnail, right? If you do thumbnails, if you just kind of jump in and you sketch and you do your thing, uh, definitely go ahead and uh, do it the way you want to, but you are trying to look for as much information as possible. Uh, okay, so that's for this reference. Uh, I'm going to use this reference here. I, I, I would say it's really bad for beginners uh, simply because a lot of people who don't know much anatomy or about perspective, the issue is that they'll fall into is that they're drawing what they see and not what they know. So they're not gonna see these perspective lines that I'm putting in to kind of make you understand that this skull is sitting flat, right? There's not a lot of shape. So again, this is another reason with using that checklist that I gave you guys, that if you don't see good lighting or if it's one lighting all the way across and there's not enough shapes, it's not giving you the artist enough information to kind of put into your piece. The more information that you are able to put, the more believable that your piece becomes when it comes to drawing on a flat surface. 
So one thing that I want to point out as well is that if someone was beginning to draw this, a beginner, nine times out of 10, they're gonna start to outline what they see and not what they know, right? So their drawing is gonna tend to look a little wonky, a little flat, but again, you'll kind of have like a, a general idea of what they're kind of drawing by that shape. Not saying it's bad, but I would definitely say you're drawing what you see and not drawing what you know. For a more advanced or intermediate artist that is learning about their anatomy and learning all about that, they'll start to kind of add shapes to kind of block out quickly what they're kind of seeing, but knowing that they can kind of see through the image. And again, the more information that your reference photo gives you, the easier it is for you. And one thing I'm trying to stress here is kind of like what I've learned uh, in photography and uh, filmmaking is you don't want to edit too much in post. And that's the idea. You don't want to manipulate your reference photo too much or when you're painting or drawing, you don't want to be kind of uh, thinking, overthinking too much. So I always tell people, you know, what you want to do is you want to work smarter, not harder, right? So instead of kind of like, oh, I got to figure out, you know, um, certain parts of the, uh, the, the, the skull, you know, the orbital is a little incorrect and you got to keep going, keep going, keep going. But if you already have that perspective already showing um, in your reference, then it's pretty much a straight kind of, you look and you do, all right? Um, so that's my little, my little crappy S kind of drawing there, but I'm just trying to illustrate the points to, to come across. Um, now I'm going to start using another reference photo. And again, on my iPhone, this is more about using um, non-figurative kind of piece. So this is more architecture, but again, still using those kind of checklists, right? Subject matter, perspective, lighting, clarity of the image. So one thing that we all know is that the perspective here is really dynamic. You can actually see, you know, from the horizon line, all of these lines are all coming in the center point of this, right? So you can actually see a lot of perspective. Now, this- Alan? Sorry to interrupt. Um, we just had a request because the red is kind of hard to see on your photos. Could you use a different color just when you're yeah. adding your perspective this, lines? What's better, black or? Um, I don't even know if black's Probably show. like something really bright only for when you're painting directly on top of the photo. Oh, oh this is getting yeah. tough. <laughs> right. I'll try you to get my have, oh I have so many panels open um, okay hold on here I'll do it like that I'll use the scratch board tool because I was using oh, yeah. the, okay that's yeah. great so, Thanks so, so what I was, yeah yeah no not a problem so what I was doing there was I was using uh the 6b pencil and why I liked it because when you use the, the Wacom um the tilt feature on here so you can go fat and thin that's the reason why I was using it but I apologize for those who couldn't really see what I was uh drawing but again back to what I was saying horizon line perspective all of these things coincide with this reference photo, right? And you wanna have as much information as possible. Um, when it comes to the lighting, what's really good is you can see the gradation from here to here, which is, again, you got your yellow, you got your orangey reds, and then it keeps going from a lighter pink to, to blue. And you could do a lot with this. If this is your reference and you're a concept artist, maybe you're trying to draw like, I don't know, an alien ship or something to that extent. Maybe it's Godzilla coming from the back here. And the idea is information, right? So you wanna have as much information as possible. Uh, and this is the reason why I would say this is a good reference photo. Now I'm gonna shoot another picture, same highway. Um, and again, I would consider this a bad reference photo, but the only thing that's really good is like the subject matter is the CN Tower. But if you were to do, like I said, you know, an alien ship trying to take over Toronto, it's good, but then there's certain things like right here, it's kind of blown out as you can see. So another thing that I want to point out is, so the lighting, it's not really dynamic. The perspective, as you can see, it's not really great to find where that um, horizon line is. And it is just a boring composition is what I would say. The image clarity is great. Uh, subject matter, if it's a CN Tower is good but I would definitely not use this as a reference photo for myself. Um, but again, if you wanted to paint over it, um, like, like I said, with an alien or Godzilla or whatnot, you can definitely do that with a piece like this. So 
uh, just making sure that you guys kind of see, you know, good versus bad. And if you have any questions, please shoot them off. All right, Tanya. Um, so now what I'm going to do here is, I, again, I took a picture of my nephew, certain things going through the category, the checklist, the four categories, subject matter, perspective, lighting, and clarity. The thing that I wanted to illustrate as well is for most beginners, what they'll do is they'll draw what they see, right? And when they draw what they see, they're kind of not drawing what they know. So for instance, I know that there's a skull here and with the lighting, you can see it's not really dynamic. So you can't really tell where that skull is and where that skull isn't. And why I'm talking about the skull is because when you're drawing a portrait, you want to make sure that the structure is there, right? So another way of showing you bad lighting is if you look at the top of his lip, his philtrum here, you can't really see that typical triangle that we see here, right? I have to add that in. So that kind of goes with what I was saying to uh, you guys earlier, where if you were a beginner, you would be rendering this as best as you can, but you're going to be lacking in that structure, right? And when it comes to the perspective here, I wouldn't say that this position of uh, an angle is very dynamic in a sense of seeing better perspective and seeing more, um, more angles of the face, which gives you more information on what to draw. So again, what I'm trying to show you guys here is I'm adding things that I would put into my portraits because I can see these even though they're not shown in this uh, picture that I took. But again, I wouldn't want to use this reference photo if I was trying to create something um, of a piece that I did here to the, to the right. So I just wanted to show you how much more information you had to add to this reference photo. Um, instead, if you took a better reference photo or found a better reference photo that has a lot more information, then that turns into you don't have to, you could just kind of look at it and just go in and, and draw. All right, um, another thing, going back to the portrait here, this is just to show you guys what I mean by more dynamic. Um, if we were to kind of throw the 3D boxes, you can see there's a lot more perspective, which gives you more information to illustrate and draw. And again, using the photo that I had, this is what I saw when I was painting this photo exactly. All right, and you can start to see how, you know, you can see the bridge of his nose clearly. You can see, his, even his uh, philtrum here is very, very, very predominant. It's not amazing lighting, but it's a lot of information due to the fact that he's capable of uh, turning his head at a quarter view. So this is what I would definitely tell people when you are trying to find a reference, you have to have these kind of information kind of running through your brain while you're looking at the piece. All right. <clears throat> let's talk about composition, all right? Let's talk about the rule of thirds, all right? So this is where you kind of have to learn about composition. And the best way to learn about composition is using a fundamental tool or rule uh, that photography and filmmakers use. And that's called the rule of, uh, the, rule, the, the rule of thirds. And what you see is these lines here, these horizontal lines, vertical and horizontal. And what it does is it turns these little boxes into nine equal boxes. And what you can see here is that, okay? And why is it important about the rule of thirds? So the thing about this is the rule of thirds is as long as you have your subject matter, anywhere, if it's horizontally, anywhere within these two lines, it actually is more visually appealing, okay? Um, but now, what you can do for artists is use these rules of thirds as also perspective guidelines, all right? So you can see how you can draw the audience in if you were to put an image here, or if you were to put the image here, you kind of have that same kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, perspective if you are following, again, the rule of third guidelines. And you can find these guidelines in your smartphone. Like I actually screenshotted this and it's what they call it a grid on your phone. And this grid is a very important composition tool that you can use as a painter 
jar, photographer, X, Y, Z, anyone that's doing any kind of visual um, medium. So now what happens if you break the rule of thirds, which you can't, which I have an image here. So as you can see, this plant here is technically not fully um, shown. A, a lot more, a, a good a good chunk of it is, is a little bit of it is cut off. But what does it kind of tell you, right? It's still kind of on the thirds, if you think about it. If you draw the thirds, it's still kind of on it. But maybe the artist that created this was kind of trying to show some sort of tension to the viewers. And this is where we kind of go into the storytelling of how you want to put your compositions, okay? So every place you put your subject matter tells a story and it gives the audience a certain vibe, a certain feel, okay? So when you look at this picture here, you can see that, you know, it's not really following much perspective because, you know, technically the perspective of this would be here, all right? And that would be the vase, I guess you would call it. <clears throat> and he is deciding to put it as close as possible to the edge. And does it show kind of tension? So the that's more up to you, the audience, of what you feel with this. Now, you can suggest certain feelings by doing it like this, but nine times out of 10, um, audiences may not get that if they don't know about you know composition rules and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so another way of talking about composition that everyone should know about is the hero pose. So I'm gonna be talking about comic books. So in comics, they always tell you if you are having a low angle, but the, the character is kind of looking up, chest out, uh, this is a hero position, right? And again, when you look at this photo, it's a very, very good reference photo simply because you can see a lot of shapes. Uh, it's very dynamic. And again, the S on his chest totally gives it away that he is Superman. But the basic idea is when you're looking up at the uh, subject matter, it is looking up, AKA looking up to is pretty much that composition. So if you are trying to make your character feel a certain way or you want more of a hero pose or it's a protagonist instead of antagonist, you'd want to have a lot of positions of composition like this. Um, now, if we go with a character looking down on you, but we're still looking up. So again, again, still looking up with the camera, but the subject matter is looking down. And once again, I just wanted to point out as well, uh, the rule of thirds. Okay. And you can still see that this photographer knew about that rule of thirds because you can see the feet. But what does it mean? It's the villainous pose person's looking down, looking down on you. And that's the kind of idea that uh, this picture is trying to do. Um, so again, that composition rule is something in comic books that I've learned. And I would want you, the audience, to try those things out. So if it's in portrait, if it's in any kind of thing, even if you're trying to uh, storyboard a car or even draw concept art, the way that the, you per, per, put the perspective on that car tells a story. <clears throat> So yeah, so that is definitely um, what I would want to say about compositioning. So just remember, wherever you do place your subject matter, um, it it tells a story. And yeah, so let me see what else. Uh, and just remember, the best composition is what you want to tell the audience. Okay. So now we're kind of jumping into the more nitty gritty of it. And we're going to be talking about using shapes to simplify images. So what I was speaking about before, talking about shapes, right? Like looking at shapes um, and, and trying to use those shapes to kind of help you have more information on your, your piece. So when it comes to drawing or sketching, the thing that most people do is that they focus too much within the subject matter in itself. But what I always tell people is you have to look on the outside, right? So what I mean on the outside, you have to look at these shapes here. So if I drew a line down here and a line across here, 
you got to look at all of this negative space, which is easier for your brain to kind of pick up in that sense, right? So when you're sketching, perhaps you need to add that into your sketch to help you have a general, and again, this is not your, this is not what you're going to keep up. You're going to color this all in, but for a gesture, you're putting as much information down as possible. And you can start to also look at uh, cutting, cutting lines into the negative space to kind of find angles because the human eye, we tend to look at geomet uh, geometrical shapes easier than trying to find complex shapes. So you can start to look at these negative spacing just to cut it so you can help figure out, hey, well, that's where the shoulder is, right? And then we can drag in that line and I see another shape, which is that huge shadow that comes down and you're just kind of blocking the huge mass. And again, you're going to refine this, but as a gesture for information for you as the artist, it is great to have. Um, and then when it starts to get into the face, you would start to look at those huge chunks like his hair. And you would be like, okay, his hair is really huge here. We're gonna cut that out like that. And then his eyes, again, following the orbital, and you're still just gesturing to that extent. Now, I don't know if you guys ever seen artist block, but that's pretty much what I'm showing you guys here is blocking, but using shapes to kind of block your image. All right, so a lot of that is, again, I would shade that all in. This would be shadow, 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 shadow. This would be shadow, 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 shadow. So <clears throat> I'm gonna jump ahead a bit and I'm going to show you guys how um, I actually started to do that shape. And one thing that Corel Painter does really, really well, all right, is using the oil pastel. Um, if I zoom in onto my piece here, you can see that I did not really work on really defining things. So when you look at the eyes here, ultimately I just put two two marks to kind of define the eyes, all right? I didn't draw on the pupil. I didn't draw on the highlights. I literally put just lines to represent everything as a big mass of shadow, okay? So when you look at this piece, I am literally just blocking in and trying to give a general um, idea of where things are, okay? And when I am doing this, I'm gonna start doing this now with the jacket. I would usually, like I said, I'll start to look at the spaces in between. If you can't see it, I'm sorry, but I'm using the oil pastel and I would just block in massively with enlarging the brush. And again, just kind of pulling back. Also make sure you zoom out so you kind of see your perspective is not wonky. And again, shading in that huge chunk where his shirt would be. All right, all right. And if you want to start to redefine the chin, you would start to make it a little bit darker. Now, one thing I do want to mention about Corel Painter and their engine, their brush engine, what's really crazy good is the mixing, how it picks up the paint from underneath. Now, if you've ever oil painted before, you understand that feeling. And Corel Painter nails that feeling from all the softwares I've used. Uh, they're the best at, at that. So as you can see it, I'm um, having my, my Wacom uh, stylus, I'm not even pushing too hard. I'm just kind of rubbing in to gradually build up that dark. And that's one thing that I absolutely love about Corel Painter's um, oil brushes is that it's very, very, very traditional inspired, or I, I don't even say it's inspired. It's literally like painting with an oil brush. Um, so again, like I said, uh, you can go in, start to really carve out those really big shapes and you start to uh, go down with it. Um, now, what you see on the bottom here is taking more complex imagery and really, 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 really simplifying it. So just, again, cutting out a tree, instead of drawing every single branch or every single leaf, you kind of just block in a big chunk to kind of illustrate or, or try to make the image look as graphically as possible. And then when you want to go in and start to refine, you can start to do that. And like I said, with Corel Painter, it gives you that. So as you can see, I have a uh, a brush and there's black paint on it, but because I'm scrubbing so closely with the white, it kind of blends into the white. 
which gives you that gradation. And I don't need a blending tool to kind of do that. You can use a blending tool if you want, but the basic idea what I'm trying to show you is you're saving time. And on top of that, you are taking a big black blob and now giving it more dimension. Again, with um, mountains, yep. Um, there's some questions coming in that may be somewhat un unrelated to exactly what you're doing. Okay. But this one is, um, I think what you're trying to illustrate by showing us these basic concepts, you know, simplifying the tree. The question is, do you ever find yourself jumping to details too fast? And how do you manage that impulse? It's, I would metaphorically tell you it's the same impulse you have by wanting to jump in and put in the highlights in your, your pieces. So we all know that highlights you, you usually use to the end um, to kind of accent the, the piece. And it's kind of like the same thing. So when you're walking, so the thing that I would say for beginners or uh, people who have to fight that urge, you have to tell yourself this when you're using if you're going in and doing every single detail so if i zoom in and i start drawing this detail right and just say um i'm drawing the eye right i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do the people um we're gonna start to put the highlights in the issue with that is now when you zoom out it kind of yeah it looks great but you have to remember all of what i just did here the blocking is not supposed to be there because if you're working so intently or, or, or very detailed on one part of the image, everything will suffer. You have to work the whole piece together. That's the thing you will have to kind of learn eventually. Because I used to do that too, where I'm like, oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw the eye first and I'm gonna make it super detailed. But then you realize with time and, and experience that it's not really about the details. It's about getting as much information down because once you get that information down, you can then go back into it and start to put and refine those pieces. And that's the thing that um, you will eventually learn that it's about you're creating an image and not just one part of the image, if that makes any sense. Good question though. And hopefully okay, I was able to you. answer it. <laughs> yeah, I'll wait and see. There is a question that I should know the answer to, and for some reason I don't, and I I can't launch it right now. But the question was, when I'm using my Wacom Intuos tablet, sometimes yep. the canvas gets knocked, so it rotates. Yeah. Is there a way to lock that? I know we can lock the canvas layer, yep. but I don't know if that actually stops, because I think each individual layer can also rotate. Do you know? Um, so what are, how is it rotating on itself? Are you hitting like the rotation button and that's how you're rotating it? I think it's just happening. And I thought that possibly touch was turned on because I, I good, yeah. that with my, with my Intuos where it's very sensitive and it will rotate the canvas. So I just said to check and make sure that touch is off. Yeah, I would say that too. If if your dial, um, the Intuos has like the the little dial too, right? Like on the yeah, side, and right. maybe maybe your hand is doing that. Um, so you have to check your settings because usually I've never ran into that. Like with this uh, Cintiq Pro that I have, if the touch is on, that's when my hand will touch the screen and then it'll start to rotate. I'm like, oh dang, what the heck? And then I'm like, oh wait, my my touch screen is on. So usually Corel's pretty good with that. But what I would um, what I would advise you to do, right, is go into your quick keys, right? And I would probably do like one of your F1, F2, F3s. And I would probably dedicate a set kind of rotate back to like uh, making it straight again. Because there, yeah. I know that you're, yeah. So I, that's one work around that if you can't do that. That's what I would say. I'd say go into your quick keys and then create a quick key. Uh, and use your macro pad and be like, okay, every time that happens, I'm going to hit F1 and then boom, my canvas is back to normal. It's going to be straight again. That's one thing I would say. Okay. Thank you. And no, then here you. is another question. And this is, it's a good one for photo artists because we have auto painting. Oh, would yeah. you ever recommend starting with auto painting and then, you know, modifying from there? I don't think that you ever do that um everybody's process is different but yeah just throwing the question out there 
So the way I break down like that, or people use like the cloning tool, like it's a tool, you know? So that's for your discretion. Uh, for me personally, coming from a traditional background, like you can, like Tanya has, knows how I work. Usually I only work on like two layers and people are like, why, why not? Why do you do two layers? I'm like, well, A, I don't run into the confusion of multiple layers. And two, I try to keep it as traditional as possible, but that's a preference, right? Anyone out there can use 15, 20, 2000 layers. It's fine. Um, so it's the same thing. I would say if you want to use the cloning tool or the auto paint, you can. Uh, the only thing I would tell you is that if you're trying to uh, use it while you're on a job, you're only doing that to save time. But again, it also reverts back to what I was teaching about starting is that reference photo yours. So if that reference photo isn't yours and you're literally mimicking someone else's piece, uh, let's just hope that the photographer or the model doesn't try to see it and sue you. That's the only advice I would give it to you. I would be like, use that tool to your own discretion. But the number one thing is it's a tool. It's there to be used. And if you want to use it, go ahead. If you don't, you don't have to. If you are an individual that tries to look down on people to do that, I don't know what to say. That's again, that's kind of your uh, prerogative that you're trying to you know, frown upon or, sh uh, or shun or make fun of people that are using a tool that was created by Crow Painter for everyone to kind of have digital art in their life. Hopefully that makes sense too. All right, so I'm just kind of, again, <clears throat> yeah. So I'm just continuing to, to push this piece. And um, if anyone has any questions about shapes, I'm pretty sure they kind of understand if there's no questions about shapes, I can move on to the 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 pretty much the the last little snippet, which is a little bit tougher um, to kind of go through in a sense of we're going to be talking about the fundamental tech, the fundamental technique of color theory. So that one, you guys let me know if you have any questions about shapes, because I'm pretty good on that and making you guys kind of um, see how that works out. Yeah, I don't see questions about shapes right now, but Dave is actually trying to kind of paint along with you and he's having issues finding the oil pastel brush. And um, I think I I know why, because yeah, I'm exactly. looking at yeah. the name of your brush there, but if you could explain that, please. Um, so the new, so the, the thing about the new um, Corel Painter 2020 too, is that they kind of got rid of, not got rid of, they're there, but you have to download the legacy brushes. And this brush that I'm using, as you can see, is like a 2016 brush. So that's why the oil pastel, but I believe it should be um, under pastels, if I'm correct. Let's see, oils, I think general maybe? Soft thick uh, artist. It might be under pastels maybe that's yep i was looking at thing yeah so i use the ver you could use the variable oily or the what was the other one that i saw here or the oil triangle oily triangle you can use that too if you have the newer one it's the same thing see i'm using the oily triangle same thing but again it gives you that same beautiful thing that i keep on stressing about is that whole it picks up the background and as hard as i push it the more paint comes out, which again is kind of like how um, oil pastels would work in real life or oils in general. Uh, One more yeah. question before you yeah. move on um, from no. Dave as well. He's wondering, did you just place the photo on the canvas or on another layer? He's just wondering how you got it there. Which one? Um, you're... Is this your nephew as well? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, oh, the, okay. the, 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 this, this piece here, the 2022? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's wondering just how'd you get the photo on the canvas? I, there is no photo. That's a painting. Um, I painted that. Oh my God. Yeah, Wait. So you, yeah, zoom in. No, the, okay, this that one. one that is one? A painting. 
But the one that you're using over on the left, like where you're drawing oh, the this guy. Oh, this guy. Yeah, no, 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 no. This is this photo is yeah. This is this is not even, this is not my nephew. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This is a this is a random photo that I found online, uh, a stock free image. So what I did was I imported the the photo and then I shrank it down and then I have it on this one layer. That's what I have. Okay. Yeah. Sense? So you can just actually place an image right on the canvas yes. if you want to, or on a layer. On a layer. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question. I was so confused. I was like, what? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, my nephew? I'm like, my nephew's right here. That's not my nephew. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't know because I just couldn't tell. <laughs> it's all Sorry. good. It's all good. It's all good. Uh yeah. So again, uh still working on the the piece, but trying to go as Basic, I don't want to use the word basic, but I'm trying to be as broad as possible. So when I'm putting brush strokes in, I am painting with just shapes, right? And keeping that in mind. And again, uh, always consistently looking back at the reference and trying to see how it lines up. And again, do you, yeah. do you ever use composite methods or layer modes? I you only use a couple layers, so I'm thinking not. No, but. I I literally so yeah, I don't. Literally, what I do is I just have it exactly like this, and I paint it beside it, and I just keep on working it until I get it to the likeness that I want it to be. So. Okay. Yeah, that's that's usually how I work. Like I said, I try to go as traditional as possible, and I guess that's what makes me a little different than other uh, digital artists or uh, other Corel Painter masters. But yeah, usually I just kind of jump in and 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 paint, and I just kind of slowly keep going until I hack it out. And yeah, like what eventually will turn out will it'll turn out to like the piece that's beside me over to the right by 2022 piece here. There's a specific interest in the drips. I don't know how uh, far you're planning <laughs> to get. Uh, so the drips, okay. So that's what everyone loves my work. And one thing I got to give shout out to Curl Painter. I was the first ones to do drips. I'm gonna, I'm gonna claim it right now because I was the first <laughs> one to do drips and splatter. And you guys came up with a splatter and, and drip paints for me. All right. So um, you can use, and it's on 2022 as well. It's the Liquid Sketcher, all right? It's under Sargent, Liquid Sketcher. And it's really cool because all you have to do is just drag it down. And instead, it does multiple things. I considered this, so what I always tell people is the same thing. It's like when you look at a tool in Corel Painter, you don't look at it under what it's titled under. You look at it what it works for you. So for me, when it comes to the drips, I found that the liquid uh, sketcher is amazing for that, but also it's really amazing to kind of get like, um, what do you call that, that people, um, I don't want to call it bleed, what, it's like a new art style that people do where they like pouring, uh, paint pours or whatever you call it, and how you can see in my piece here, you can see it right down here with the blues. So if I zoom in on my painting, you can start to see the textures and all the thick paint, but right here, it gives you that kind of um, paint pour uh, feel. And that's what I use uh, there. And this is the brush that I was using. Um, and then I would also use the water rake brush and that would be for my straight drops. But usually for this, this mimics a solid uh, ink drip. And again, it couldn't be done if I didn't have a Wacom tablet. I would say if you did this on a mouse, I don't think you would be capable of doing this with a mouse uh, to get these kind of drips uh, on, on your piece. So I'm gonna move on to the next thing, which is going to be about color theory. So I was sitting down and I was trying to think about an exercise that would work for everyone to practice on, right? And one fundamental technique is about color theory. And the basic color theory, how I learned in school and how I continue to learn is you have to use the primary colors. So you start with these three colors here. You have your yellow, you have your red, and then you have your blue, okay? And what I've been saying earlier about one thing about Corel Painter that it does amazingly, it does amazing mixing. So for instance, I'm using this red, all right? I 
I picked up that red and now I go to the yellow and you just scrub a little bit and you can start to see how the orange starts to form, right? Now, why is that important? Is because in color theory, when we learned in school, these were the three colors that they would force us students to only paint with. So we would have to do the same thing, which I'm kind of bringing that exercise to you guys, but I'm trying to do it more fun and be like, you can do um, where you kind of teach yourself about hot and cold, right? And what I mean by hot and cold is when you look at this portrait, again, same portrait, but I'm using the primary colors, you can start to see that cold is where the shadows are and warm is right where the meeting or the middle tone of the highlight and the shadow kind of go into. And that's why you kind of see the reds here. And the yellow, of course, I'm going to use as highlights. Now, before I even jump into that, what I would always tell people is like, if you want to learn how to render anything, uh, Rembrandt said that if you could render a sphere perfectly um, and make it three-dimensional, you can render anything. And that is very true. And again, going back into geometrical shapes, and again, going back into shapes of uh, what I was speaking about earlier, this all kind of coincides with that. So I'm using a red first, and now I'm going to start using the blue. And I will start to, and again, there's no reference here. I'm just kind of making this up as I go along. Uh, and you would start to add these colors. Now, blue and red mix purple, which is great because that's the darker, uh, the darker color out of the, the two. And what you would start to do is you would start to kind of work on your shadowing, all right? But only using these three primary colors. And again, using red going back. Now, at a certain point, you're gonna have to want it to get darker. But what I would advise you to do is once you get to that purple, I would ink drop it, pick up that purple, go over to your color wheel, and then you can go down a bit and start to play with the hue of the, the purple and start to make it darker, right? And that's where is, is a two-fold kind of exercise where it forces you to be like, well, how do I get this darker? Um, you have to know how to mix the right colors. Right, and that's what I would tell people uh, here. That's one exercise is using these three colors and painting whatever you want to paint. I'm purposely using a sphere because I'm trying to illustrate um, Rembrandt's idea, but in a modern context. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to point out too when it comes to this mixing and another way to learn, again, using Corel Painter, all right, is they have this real gangster mixing tool here, which I can't remember. When did this come out, Tanya? Was it like 2018? Was am I right or am I wrong? Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, testing right? my memory on the exact date. Uh, I think it was actually before that. It was before that? Yeah, I think it's been in the product um, pretty much from the time that. Painter arrived at Corel. I really? want to say, but I may be wrong. Um, okay, it's okay. I'll look it up. <laughs> it's okay. But right here to the right, as you can see, you go into your mixer, okay? And I would, again, keep it to the primary colors. Use the red. Now grab some yellow and mix that yellow. Don't push hard, but you can slowly start to add more yellow to get that orange, all right? And you can keep going, add some more yellow, add some more yellow until you get that perfect orange. And then from there, I would probably eye drop tool it. Right. And then you can start to use that when you're painting. So that's another way of utilizing a tool and learning some fundamentals of color. All right. And I would start to do that. And uh yeah then use some yellow so that's the same reason why i drew the face up there and i was going to continue which i will continue um to paint uh that colored face because i'm going to use the same techniques as i'm showing here on this sphere um, that i'm drawing and trying to show you guys how to learn color theory and how to blend the color so that it works out where it the sphere is as three-dimensional as possible. Now, a disclosure, I might not get enough time to finish this 
sphere to look exactly super hyper realistic, uh, which isn't my point. My point is it's an exercise for you, the audience, to try out yourself. And, uh, and hopefully you guys will be able to uh, learn a few things uh, doing so. And just remember, failing is a part of art, and that's how you get better. You have to fail a bunch of times. So again, continuing to render this fear, um, and I would do the same thing with uh, this painting. So I was painting it in black and white. Again, I am painting it now with the blues and just slowly working the same concept where I am now looking at the shadows using the same shape um, language that I was showing you guys earlier and kind of building on those shapes and still pushing this piece. So yes, anyone has questions? This is the time to talk. <laughs> They're kind of quiet. I'm just gonna go back through and make sure I didn't miss anything. I think a lot of them you inadvertently answered without me having to ask you. Perfect. Um, you know, I was gonna make a comment when you were showing the drips. Yep. And this is probably gonna go over some people's heads, but we have these special media layers and the new yep. capability in 2022 is taking a paint layer and lifting it to watercolor. Yeah. So you could actually lift that up to watercolor and then wet that layer. Yeah, and then drip it if down. If you really wanted it to look like wet, you could do that. You could lift it up to thick paint and start mixing with, you know, super thick paints. So yep. there's so much that can be done. But I do believe that you are the one that started the whole Yep, <laughs> kind drip. of splatter painting. That's your trademark. Yeah, that's uh, and then my audience, my community call it pow pow, right? So I would pow pow the canvas with that, and that's what they all enjoyed. So yeah, but that's the thing, and that's why I love Corel Painter because the tools are very. I, I like. I always have to argue with people when they're like, "Yeah, digital is mimicking," and I'm like, ah, "It's not. It's a tool, dude. It's just a tool." And yes, if you want to say it's mimicking traditional mediums because traditional came first. That's fine. But again, Corel Painter does a very, 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 very phenomenal job when it comes to these traditional mediums. Um, okay, yeah. I did forget to answer a question. I'm very thankful to Wacom for providing that discount code. Yep. Can, can people access that? It's not only the Canadian website, is it? Uh, that is only for my Canadians. Unfortunately, the wacomstore.ca oh. is only for my Canadians. Okay. For the Americans, if you guys want it, uh holler at me and i gotta go talk to my lovely welcome family and hopefully they'll hook me up with like uh a code for everyone around the world kind of thing but as of right now i know that there's going to be a sale on the welcome one and i think it's like august 1st to the 14th so but again for my but for my canadian fans because welcome canada is the one that gave me uh that code i would have to talk to my american counterparts and probably hook you guys up and if you guys want that hookup uh hit me up on my social media and uh yeah and i'm literally at colin chan everywhere so benefits okay, of uh great yeah, yeah yeah okay now questions are coming in let's see here um do you have any advice for creating flesh tones yeah what we're doing right now color theory so what so the painstaking thing so the rule of thumb um and again I'm giving you guys art school tips. So in art school, they made us first paint with these three primary colors. And as you can see when I'm shading this, like if you pay attention to this circle, this orange is now technically blending in with the yellow and the red. That is looking more skin tone. So if I wanted to add it to this piece, you can start to see, and it's about glazing too, right? So again, you have to really have a strong knowledge base on your color theory, knowing if, this this color mix, what does it happen? This this color mix. And another thing is you want to try to make sure the flaw of what most people do is like they'll take the eyedrop tool and they'll uh, pick up the paint from the photo or uh, they'll look at the orange-ish section and be like, I think this is skin tone. So you have to not just look at that. You have to then think about, okay, now if you're painting uh, shadows over it, you know, what blue is not going to turn that orange into 
brown dookie color. So they always tell you in art school, like try to make sure that your paint or your skin tones don't look like mud. So if it's starting to look like mud, it's simply because you are lacking the knowledge, which you can, you can receive do through this color theory that I just showed you guys. So like if you literally sat here an hour a day trying to render a sphere with just these three colors, you are going to learn how to mix colors. You are going to learn what colors are going to work um, in your paintings. And then flesh tone is just literally, if you look at each person's flesh tone, um, each ethnicity, you again can make it with just these three colors alone. So you have to kind of try your best to learn about um, mixing colors through the primary colors. That's what I would say. You can also, if you really want to cheat, yep. create a color set from an image. Yep. Um, that's another way to narrow it down. But I mean, obviously, yep. if you really want to become a proficient artist, everything you're showing here is the most valuable way to learn, <laughs> rather yeah. than trying to cheat your way through things. Well, which you see, I wouldn't say it's cheating, right? Like, I think, th I think that stereotype is going to end soon to an extent. But like, at the same time, like, if it's about timing, right? So, if, so the reason why a lot of uh, artists or people uh, say it's cheating is because like you're not really doing the work; it, you're allowing uh, the program to do the work for you. But at the same time, um, as professional artists, it's about time consumption too. So, if you have to do a big job and you know you can get away with it, and Corel Painter is gonna, you know, paint it for you quicker, you can do that. But you still have to add your thing to it because Corel Painter can only take you so far and then it stops, right? It, and what I mean by that is like, it stops in a sense of like, okay, you want this photo to be painted uh, using the clone tool, all that. Sure, it'll look exactly like that, but you still have to go in and add those splatters, the drips, the finer details, you know? And how are you going to do that if you don't have that knowledge base? And and art is always, always to me is a skill, it's a skill base, uh, uh, skill-based occupation and it's all about skills you just got to learn about those skills and those skills come with experience and and time so yeah so i don't want to dog anyone that's doing it i just want to make sure that people understand you have to look at it the same way as the the word that i use it's a tool it's a tool to be used it's kind of like making fun of a uh, a construction worker because he uses a hammer <laughs> as, as crazy as that sounds that's how i would break it down so if you want to use it you can if you don't want to use it, you can. For those people um, that joined us a little bit late, we are recording the session and I'll have it up on YouTube once it's done processing, like in a, a couple hours, just to remind everybody. Um, this is an interesting question from Mark. He's asking, in your opinion, how important is it to use the grain settings for texture? It's kind of a loaded question, or should it be added later? Um, whoo, that's yeah, tough. It's like a, it's it's, it's like what? One. Yeah, like what are you working on? That's what I usually would tell you, right? Like if you're trying to draw a portrait, um, I would do it later because those are because textures are accents, right? Like if that makes any sense, like unless if you're a fine artist and you're trying to do like abstract work then texture from the get you have to have it if you're a concept artist and you're doing like machines or robots again you wouldn't put in like um like a, a concept artist for star wars back in the day when they did it traditional mediums before they did it digital they were using markers and then they used they didn't they didn't really you know have a tool to put like uh metallic over their their robots right like they had to kind of like lie and illustrate that to the audience saying, hey, it's metallic. So yeah, it, that's how I would roll with that question. It's like, well, is it, um, what are you using it for? And how important is it? And if you're saying, oh, I'm using it for a portrait, then I would say, learn about the anatomy, finish everything, and then put the textures on. And, and it's a lot easier because at least then you're not stressed that, oh, that doesn't look like skin. And and since I'm uh, since I'm rendering or painting, you know the texture is outside of the line. So now what am I going to do? So that's where I would say you can fall into little mistakes like that. 
Okay, I'm just taking a look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, would you have a recommendation for a good brush for hair, something that shows a lot of the bristles? Yeah, so I use, I don't know if you guys have it. It's under thick brush, but I actually used this variant. Um, and this was like a very old brush that uh, I believe like, I don't even know if you can get this in, in here. Let me see if we can. Hold on. Let me find it. I, I, I Again, I'm not guaranteeing it, but I'm pretty sure. Is it this one? Would this one work? Mm, no, that's too thick. There might be something. I think um, just remembering back to some tutorials, I think acrylics have a decent number of kind of hairy brushes yeah so like when i do my hair brushes like i have i think it's this one this brush i use and again you can see how oh, it yeah. gives you yeah right? it gives you that fine but again it's a brush that was created from corral <laughs> for me so i kept it so this is like a secret brush um but it was well, actually it's a, it's a bristle brush i know that yeah yeah and a lot of the brushes guys if I mean, everything is customizable. We're trying to keep things a little bit simpler here, but Same you mind. can open up the brush controls. And if a brush yeah. has those bristles, you can thin them out, you can thicken them, you can add more, you can remove. So yeah. um, we do have tutorials for that stuff as well. Yeah, but I would like definitely also say too, um, when it comes to hair, when you look at any, uh, Okay, since you're doing hair, if you're doing animal portraits, right? Like if you look at the best uh, animal portrait artists that do it with oils, they don't necessarily put every single fur on their painting. What they tend to do is exactly what I just showed you guys here where they block out the hair and then only add like white little highlights to kind of illustrate to the audience that it's fur. So I always will tell people like um, it kind of goes back it kind of goes back to that individual. I don't know if it was uh, Mark, not Mark. I can't remember the first person that was asking about uh, doing detailed, um, like starting really detailed first. That's yeah. the same thing as like animals, right? Like why would you be drawing the fur so crazy? But again, like certain hyper-realistic artists do that. And again, it's a little different when they're, they're doing it uh, traditionally to digitally. Um, but again, most of the time it's all about suggestions. So I would really advise uh, those who are trying to do every single strand of hair um, on an animal or a uh, person, it's kind of a waste because when you look at hair, even when you look at this image, um, I will use the red and Tanya said, don't use six brush, gotta use scratchboard tool. So even when you look at this, it's a shape. That's what we, I was, what today's lesson's all about is looking at these shapes and really looking at the shape and understanding that even this dark up here and all of in between is highlights. So instead of going in and, and drawing every single highlight, right? Or again, drawing every single hair in the beginning, I would break it down where I would see this shape, paint it black, see this shape, paint it black, and then, you know, blend it all in where it would be a light tone gray and then only use the white highlights to kind of only put a couple of little 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 uh i guess bob ross little ch -ch, that's what i <laughs> a little ch -ch, a little sweeping motions and that's what i would tell you to do because what did what did we just do we just saved time while you're sitting here for hours upon hours putting each and every single uh piece of hair on this uh kid's head i'm just gonna come in and just boom 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 and suggest to the audience, hey, uh, that's hair, and that's how it's gonna look like in a simpler way, and you know it's a painting. Does that make sense? It it makes total sense to me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, people have different styles. Some are photorealistic, and yeah. you know, if they're a photographer and a painter, a lot of their clients probably want photorealism. Yeah. Um, it just depends. There's different styles, but all these techniques that you're teaching, I mean, these are traditional painting techniques, not 
just for photos. Yeah. 100%. You know, a yep. fine artist could still use a photo as reference. They're not using cloning tools to paint right from it. Yep. Okay, so we are at the top of the hour and oh. um some people are asking, do you have regular tutorials on your YouTube channel? I know you do a lot of streaming. Yep. Uh, right now, I, I'm beginning to stream on TikTok every day. Uh, tutorials, I do have a tutorial with Wacom as well. So I do have a YouTube channel, again, under Colin Chan. Uh, I also sometimes do tutorial videos for Tanya. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more information, like I said, you could always shoot out a DM or um join me on a on a TikTok live or you can harass Tanya to be like Colin Chan needs to be doing lives every single day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then finally, do you have any recommendations for favorite sources of learning for these, you know, kind of the basic techniques that you're talking about that aren't necessarily related only to painter, but to art overall? Uh for free, like so. For for free, I would usually say like go look at books, right? But then at the same time, you can go on YouTube, and there's a lot of YouTubers. Like I know one YouTuber, but I think if you dig deep enough, I think a lot of their fundamentals they do still have up for free on their YouTube. And I think it's called Proco. So they're they're really well known in YouTube, and they have a lot of uh, solid fundamentals. Uh, that they put up as well um but on that yeah there's just so many like there's not one specific place that i would be like go here this is where you get it because there's even schools as well right yeah uh, like there's a lot schools. of resources and youtube is invaluable yeah while we're speaking of that um i mean a lot of people are asking about our painter cloning techniques we do have videos on that yeah, I don't um, know how to do that. To our, yeah, if you go to our learning center, you can learn about the cloning aspects. If you do want to literally paint right on top of the photo, you can do you that. Can you can auto paint. Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of tutorials that we create that are free that you can just go and explore on learn.corel.com. And yep. of course, YouTube, they're all on our YouTube channel, which is YouTube forward slash painter tutorials. Yeah. If so you check out, yeah, sorry. Uh, if oh you go into God. the, yeah, if you go into the Corel Painter, the last live that we did, um, that has a lot of fundamentals that we ran through. So I want to make sure that we went through that. I think that's like a year or two ago, 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. Me and Tanya actually did do another uh, live stream and that's where I literally break down step by step on how to create like portraits so if you're looking for that I would definitely listen to what Tanya's saying go into the YouTube and they have a crap ton of information from other artists and and even myself leaving some videos there as well and a lot of what you were showing today somebody had asked is this applicable to painter 2019 yes yeah 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 like this is applicable to a painter all the way across and you can even use uh, this on, I think even essentials, like I've used essentials before and you can, you can do what I'm doing right now on essentials as well. Though, sure. like I didn't use any yeah. thick, I didn't use any thick paints. You just find a tool and you just start to uh, use these uh, advices or information that I gave those lovely people. Okay. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for taking us from beginning concepts through to Painting, um, there was one more question. People are just dying to know the brushes that you used in your final painting of your nephew. Um, so thick thick paintbrush. Um, all of my brushes here, it's like, so I use the smooth round oils. I use a lot of the dry scalloped um, oil pastel is definitely my go-to, but also the real oil filberts. Um, and you guys already saw that I use the Liquid Sketcher. I also use the soft uh, velocity for kind of like the the airbrushing styles as well. Uh, what else did I use? I'm uh, sure oh, it's hard yeah. to remember everything, Colin. <laughs> uh, but I don't use too much. And then the next one I think for is grainy waters and water rakes. That's pretty much it. And it's just literally 
painting over, like if I were to scrape off the thick paint, there's like so much paint underneath that, but you can't see it. Cause like I said, I only do it in like two layers and that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Well, amazing. Thank you for letting us know about the brushes for all your tips. We greatly appreciate you, Colin. Um, I, this was a great session. And if you could see all the feedback, there's all kinds of thank yous coming in. So everybody, it is recorded in case you came late, had issues with sound. Let's hope that yeah. didn't happen, but um, we'll pop yeah. this up on YouTube by the end of the day. And you will also get a reminder tomorrow from GoToWebinar with the link. And I can also link you over to Colin's various social channels and whatnot so that you can connect with him. Yep. And remember, all the Canadians, you guys could get $30 off using the code CHAN, C-H-A-N, at wacomstore.ca to get a new Wacom One. All right? So Okay. So it's only too. for the Wacom One. Is yep, that yep. correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Only for the Wacom One. All right. Perfect. Okay. Bye, everybody. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Colin. You can go take a break now. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right. We will talk to you soon, everybody. Have a good one.